Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number two, we left off at verse number two. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ma ya'tihim min dhikrim min rabbihim muhdathin illa istama'uhu wa hum yal'aboon. No new reminder came to them from their Lord, but that they listened to it while they played. If you recall, brothers and sisters, when we spoke about the first verse of the surah, the first verse begins with a warning. One of the unique features of this particular surah is that the surah begins with a climactic statement. You know, in many other chapters of the Quran, it kind of builds up to a climax. There's almost like a, a punchline in the uh, in the surah. However, with this particular surah, with Surah Al-Anbiya, the surah begins with a very powerful message, with a very strong tone. It's like almost as though that the Quran is, this surah is sounding an alarm that the day of resurrection, the day of reckoning is imminent. And not only is it imminent, it is approaching rapidly. It is very close. And you are delusional if you think that it's a future, if it's, it's something that's going to happen in the distant future. And how, what is the condition of mankind? in relation to this imminent day of reckoning, this rapidly approaching day of accounting. Allah says, وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مُعْرِضُونَ The people are in a state of ghafla, they're in a state of heedlessness. They're not paying attention. مُعْرِضُون Or they're just not interested, or they just full out, full out reject the notion of life after death. وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مُعْرِضُونَ Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, in the following verses, He's going to speak about these individuals who are heedless of the, the day of reckoning, who, are, who don't believe in this prophetic message, who don't believe in the message of God. And it's important for us to keep in mind that even though the descriptions the primary addressees in these verses are the, the Meccans, the Mushrikeen of, of Mecca. So even though they are being described and they are being reprimanded and they are the ones who are being admonished, we shouldn't think for a moment that, that these verses have nothing to do with us. That Allah, oh, you know, Allah is just talking to the Mushrikeen. He's not talking to me and you. And that's a mistake, my dear brothers and sisters, because even when Allah Azza wa Jal addresses disbelievers, when He addresses pagans, when He addresses people from different faith traditions, there's also a lesson for us. So even though these are individuals who rejected the message of God, even though these are people who are antagonistic and they were hostile towards the Prophet, sometimes you and I, as believers, sometimes we exhibit some of their behavior. Sometimes we may exhibit some of their attitudes and their, and their behavior. So we shouldn't think that just because Allah is first and foremost offering a description of, you know, uh, the mushrikeen, that, you know, these verses are, are not related to us. They're in a state of heedlessness. They've turned away from this important, critical reality. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, describing these people, مَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ ذِكْرٍ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ مُحْدَثٍ Now, I want to break this verse up into, uh, into, into smaller sections so we can understand. Number one, I want to draw your attention to the verb in the verse, يَأْتِيهِمْ Atta is the past tense verb, and yeti is the present tense. So yeti means to come, to arrive. And 
when this when a present tense verb when fi'l mudhara is used it indicates an action that is present and future now in the arabic language the way that you negate a present tense verb is that usually you use the letter la la and nahiya but you find with this verse Allah begins with ma, which is an unusual way of negating a present tense verb, fi'l mudhara. So I'll give you an example. So the word kataba, kataba means he wrote. When did he write? In the past. And the way that you negate a past tense verb is you say ma kataba. So you use the the letter ma, the word ma, to negate a past tense verb. If I say yaktubu, he writes. When does he write? He writes now. The action is taking place now, and maybe even in the future. The way that you negate a present tense verb, fi'l mudara, a present future tense verb, is you use the word la la yaktubu here allah does something interesting he uses the word ma which typically negates a past tense verb to negate a present future tense verb and in in the science of arabic rhetoric in balagha this is done for emphasis so the negation is emphasized, meaning Allah is as though it's as if Allah is saying that these people rejected the reminder in the past, they reject it in the present, and they will continue to reject it in the future. It's a strong negation. So Allah says, No new reminder came to them from their Lord but that they listened to it while they played now never does a reminder come to them now the word for reminder that is used in this verse is there never comes to them a reminder from their lord that is new, that is fresh, except that they listen to it and they play. Min dhikrin. Another, another linguistic insight that I'd like to draw your attention to is that the word dhikr, and this requires you know, some familiarity with the Arabic language. The word dhikr, it means remembrance. It means a reminder. In the Arabic language, there are certain words that are derived from dhikr that carry subtle, different. There's a difference of meaning that's very subtle. So, for so the word dhikr refers to a type of reminder that is very subtle and implicit. The word tevkira is a very strong, explicit, direct reminder. Tadhkira. Dhikra is also a more intense way of reminding. I'll give you a very simple example. Imagine you're sitting with a group of people and one of, the, one of these individuals who you're sitting with, they start to backbite. They start to do riba. And you want to kind of give them a reminder that we shouldn't be doing this. If I say, hey, don't backbite, it's haram to backbite. That type of reminder is called tadhkira because it was very explicit. It was very direct. And usually when you remind people in that way, they can become very defensive. Tadhkira. It's an explicit, direct, it's an overt type of reminder. If I say, if that person is backbiting and I 
and I change the subject. So, so, so they start backbiting, and I say, you know, what do you what do you think about what happened in the UK today with the uh, with Boris Johnson becoming the the new prime minister? So what did I do there? I was I redirected the conversation. I was very subtle in the way that I addressed the problem. So I reminded them that we shouldn't be doing this, but I did it in what way? In a very subtle, a very gentle way. This is called dhikr, to remind in a very subtle and implicit way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that these people, these individuals who rejected the Prophet, who reject the message of God, they are so stubborn, they are so closed-minded, that even when they are given gentle, and, and the word min is a harf, it's a particle, a particle that, that uh, denotes tab'il, meaning min dhikran, it means like a small, little, gentle reminder that even then, they reject. This shows you how stubborn they are. That even when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offers them a very gentle, a very subtle reminder, they still refuse. They are unwilling to change anything about their lives. Ma him never does a gentle, a small, gentle reminder come to them. Now, sometimes people, you know, when you give them advice, when you remind them to do things, they might not listen to you because they might think, who are you, right? People, people can be very defensive. You give someone advice and they say, who are you to advise me? But this is not just any reminder. This is not a reminder that's coming to you from a stranger. You know, because sometimes people, they give you advice and they say, who are you? What are you, my father? Right? People reject because they feel that the one who is reminding is not qualified. You, who are you? You don't have the authority to tell me what to do. But Allah here says what? مَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ ذِكْرٍ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ That this is... A gentle, a small, gentle reminder from who? From their Rabb, from their Lord. And the word Rabb is being used. Meaning that, so what, what's being invoked here is that this is a small, gentle reminder from the one who is your Rabb. The word Rabb, it carries the meaning of that this is a Lord, this is a creator, a God, who is concerned about your well-being. This is a Lord who wants you to reach your full potential as a human being. He's your sustainer, your provider, your cherisher. It's from Him. And He has no vested interest in this reminder. Allah doesn't gain anything from reminding you. You are the absolute beneficiary. Remember that this is a reminder coming to you from one who does not benefit from even reminding you. It doesn't matter whether you listen or not. It, it's all for you. He's your Rabb. He's concerned about your well-being, your growth, your spiritual maturation. He wants to nurture you. So. Sometimes people reject, they turn away from reminders because they feel that the person who's reminding them is not qualified. But Allah says, no, this is dhikrim min rabbihim. Wa min dhikrim min rabbihim. This is from your Lord. It's not from a stranger. It's from the one who created you. He knows you and he is closer to you than any other being. Another reason why people ignore reminders and they ignore advice and they ignore admonishments is what they say oh you know i've heard this before 
I've heard this before. You know, that's why sometimes when people, they go and listen to a lecture, sometimes you find people, they're on their phones, they're not paying attention. And if you tell them, how come you're not paying attention? They said, oh, no, no, I've heard, I've heard Monana tell the story before. I've, I've heard this topic. I've heard this before. This is not new material. I've heard the story a million times. I've memorized that hadith. So they turn away because it's redundant. You know, speaking of, of the attitude of the recipient of advice and the one who's listening to a reminder is that sometimes we focus so much on whether or not we've heard it before that we need to focus more on whether or not we have implemented the, the advice. You know, sometimes we say, oh, I've heard this before. Oh, it's a lecture on taqwa. Oh, I, I've heard tens of lectures about, about taqwa. But the question is, it's not whether you've heard this before or not. Have you implemented these instructions? Are you following? Are you acting? Are you practicing what you know? You know, this is why Ayatollah Bahjat, rahmatullahi alayhi, may Allah bless his soul, this great marja. I believe he passed away in 2009. Subhanallah, 10 years ago. You know, many people, he was a, a marja, he was a faqih. And he was really the spiritual icon of the Shia world at the time, during his life. He was a man that was renowned for his spirituality and his worship. People used to come to him. Many talaba, seminary students, they would seek his advice. And... You know, he would offer them advice, advice from, from, you know, how to offer your prayers on time, how to develop presence of heart in your prayers. So students would come to him and he'd give them advice. And the next day, they would ask him for more advice. They wanted something new. And he would say to them that you came back to me so quickly. Did you implement? Did you practice what I, what I instructed you? So as listeners, when we listen to reminders, when we listen to advice, our first question shouldn't be, oh, you know, whether you've heard this or not. We shouldn't be so focused on whether, you know, we've heard this before or not. What should be a matter of real concern to us is that we have to ask, have I implemented this? Have I have I put this into, into practice? So this is with respect to the listener of the advice. Now, if you are the one who is doing the reminding, and this is an important lesson that we learned from this verse. Now here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who is reminding. What does Allah say? مَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ ذِكْرٍ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ مُحْدَثٍ Allah describes this small, gentle reminder as being, as being what? As being new. As being something that is fresh. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this small, gentle reminder that He gives is muhdath. Muhdath meaning it's something that is new. It is something that is fresh. When you look at the Quran, some people, when, when they read the Qur'an, they think that you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats a lot. For example, if you look at the story of Musa, it's mentioned. It, it almost seems it, it's mentioned verbatim in different chapters in the Qur'an. The story of Adam and Iblis and Iblis's refusal to prostrate to Adam, it's mentioned a number of times in the Qur'an. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being redundant? You know, this is something that we have to keep in mind when we teach, when we are reminding. Is Allah being redundant? The answer is no. So even though the story of Musa is mentioned in multiple places in the Quran, even though the story of Adam in Iblis is mentioned in multiple places in the Quran, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he presents it from a different perspective. He shares a different, a different insight. He adds a detail that was not mentioned in the other uh, in the other surah. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way that He communicates these reminders is that He keeps it fresh, He keeps it new, He presents it you know, in different ways, He changes the style. So as a speaker, as speakers, as educators, this is also something that we need to keep in mind, that we don't fall into this, this, uh, this redundancy, that we're not redundant, that we can take a concept and we could present it from, from different perspectives. So muhdath, it, it's something that is new, it's something that is fresh. So, and, and this is something that's also very interesting, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He reveals the Torah to Musa, and the Injil to Isa, even though the essence of the message is the same, there are differences. It's a fresh message. There is something new to it. So Allah, so going back to this, the ayah, مَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ ذِكْرِمْ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ مُحْدَثٍ Never comes to them a small, so if I want to retranslate it, you know, to capture the, the nuances of the verse. So never comes to them a small, gentle reminder from their Lord which is new, which is fresh, except that they listen while they play. Now the word muhdath, as I said, it means something new. It means something that's fresh. And it's an adjective of dhikr. It's, so muhdath here is a sifa. It's an adjective. And the noun is what? Dhikr. Now usually in the Arabic language, the sifa, the adjective comes immediately after the noun. So for example, you have rajulun kareem. A man, so rajul is the, the, uh, the mawsuf, it's the noun. And the sifa is what? Kareem, generous. It comes immediately after the noun. But here, in this verse, there was a break. So Allah didn't say, ma yatihim. مِنْ ذِكْرٍ مُحْدَثٍ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ So muhdath does not come immediately after dhikr. مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ is in the middle. Why? Because Allah here is trying to convey that what makes the reminder important is not that it's new, it's that it's from your Lord. What makes this gentle, the small gentle reminder so important is the one who is reminding you. So it's not just that you should, you know, lend your ears because it's something new. No, what makes it valuable, what makes it worthy of your attention is that this is a reminder from your Lord. That is new. So the adjective for reminder comes after the mentioning of who is doing the reminding. So, a reminder is only as good as the, the position of the, the one who's doing the reminding. So this is a reminder from, from your Lord, from the one who's interested in your well-being, your, the one who nurtures you. And look at the mercy of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's within His right to give a very direct, overt, explicit reminder. As we said, this is the meaning of tadhkira. But Allah is so merciful that when He reminds us, He does it in the most gentle and subtle way so we don't get defensive. Imagine, you know, Allah speaks to us as if we're in a position of power. Just so he, because he doesn't want to give us any reason to rebel. He speaks to us so kindly and so gently. Now there are times where Allah is, is, is much more direct and much more overt. But in many cases throughout history, the reminders have been very gentle. So not only does he gently remind, and he does it in a subtle way, he presents fresh reminders because Allah knows that we have a very short attention span. Oh, if we heard it before, we're not going to listen. So 
because Allah knows that most of humanity, they have ADHD. If, if it's not something new, they're not going to listen. Short attention span. So to ensure that we don't turn away because of boredom and redundancy, he makes sure that the remind this small, gentle reminder has something that's fresh about it, something new. So Allah is saying that the, no, never does, never comes to them a short, gentle reminder from their Lord that is new, except how do, so how do they respond? They listen. You know, istama'u comes from istima'. Istima' means not just to hear. Allah didn't say that they, sama' is to hear. Istima' means to listen attentively. But are they listening attentively in order to reflect? In order to process what the Prophet is saying? No. They're listening attentively in a mocking way. You know when you want to insult someone and you, you want to say something important and they're not taking you seriously, they lean in and they, and they pretend that they're listening attentively. But all they're doing is that they're just they're just trying to gather more ammunition for their mockery. So they're not listening to understand. They're listening to, to prepare for what they're going to make fun of next. Oh, did you hear what did you hear the newest thing that Muhammad taught his followers? So they may look like they're listening at and Allah says, no. They're mocking. They're making a joke out of it. So they listen. It's almost like they, they're, they're acting like a bunch of comedians. You know, they're listening for material so they can mock the Prophet. Now, you know, going back to this, this idea of, of, you know, changing and presenting the message in a new and a fresh way without altering the message, but Presenting it in a way that's that's new from a different perspective. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in many times, many times in the Quran, because Allah is so interested in our guidance that He presents reminders in different ways. So perhaps one of those reminders may inspire us, might motivate, mo might motivate us to change. And we when we cover Surah Al-An'am in Surah 65, we spoke about this, where Allah says, Undur. Look at, don't you see how we diversify the signs? We, we employ many different ways to remind and to guide people so perhaps they may understand. So perhaps they may understand. So not only are these people so they're they're making they're making fun of the message you know it's one thing to just say that i'm not interested but to to mock to mock the message so not only are these people spiritually numb revelation is not affecting their heart they they've developed nefarious hearts so not only are they heedless not only are they disinterested they're actively mocking the message. They're making disparaging remarks about the messenger and the message. Now, we mentioned that the Quran, the Quran speaks about the message always being fresh, always being new. And I'm sure, brothers and sisters, when you read the Quran, even though the Quran was revealed 14 centuries ago, it's still feels like a living book because it is a living book sometimes you read the same surah you read the same surah you could read surah ar-rahman every day and you just you don't get bored of it because it's alive and this is why we have uh, there's an interesting hadith where imam al-kadhim alayhi salam our seventh imam he quotes a conversation between a man who came to visit his father with a question about the Quran? Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam he says, "Inna rajulan sa'ala Aba Abdullah, 
that a man came and he asked Aba Abdullah, which was the kunya of his father, Imam al Sadiq. He asks Imam al Sadiq, Ma balu al Quran la yazdadu ala nashri wa dars illa ghadaba. He asks the Imam that, O oh, grandson of the Prophet, O oh, Imam, how is it that the Quran, you know, dis despite the fact that it is read constantly and we study it constantly and it is spread far and wide, it does not, it doesn't become redundant, meaning it increases, it, it's, it, it remains fresh. It's as though you're reading it for the first time. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى It's because Allah, the Blessed, the Exalted, لَمْ يَجْعَلْهُ لِزَمَانٍ دُونَ زَمَانٍ Because the Qur'an was not revealed for a specific time. The Qur'an is as relevant today as it was 14 centuries ago. It wasn't just revealed for them. It was revealed for us in our time. And it was not revealed for one group instead of another. So even though the Arabs were the recipients of the Qur'an, the Qur'an is not for pe the people of the Arabic culture. The Qur'an is not a book that promotes the Arabic culture. Even though it was revealed in Arabic, the Qur'an is for the Chinese as much as, as it is for the Arabs. So it's not that the Arabs are, you know, the Qur'an belongs to them and then they're just sharing it with the rest of us. No. The Qur'an belongs to the non-Arab as much as it belongs to the Arab. فَهُوَ فِي كُلِّ زَمَانٍ جَدِيدٍ So in every era, it is new, it is fresh. وَعِنْدَ كُلِّ, وعند كل قَوْمٍ غَضُوا إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامِ And it will remain fresh for every people, for every generation until the Day of Judgment. You know, there's a difference, brothers and sisters. You know, imagine I'm sitting in a classroom and I give a book to one student and I say, share it with the other students. If I do that, that means the child who received the book is the primary recipient and the others are just, they have an opportunity to see the book. He can, the, the student can share it with others. But if I give the book to each student, that means it's equally theirs. It's not being shared with them. It belongs to them. So the Qur'an is it's new and it's fresh because each individual, so even though the Prophet is the official recipient of wahi, the message of the Qur'an is for each individual in every single time. And the Imams, they say that every Laylatul Qadr, the Qur'an is renewed. It's as though the Qur'an is being revealed. It's not that a new Qur'an is descending. The Qur'an is descending again. There is a live image of it on earth that is reflecting what is in Allah al-Mahfuz. In verse number three, Allah continues the description of, of these individuals. With hearts preoccupied, and those who do wrong conceal their private conversations. Is this except a human being like you? So would you approach magic while you see? Allah describes their hearts. So when you mock the message, when you ridicule the prophet, and when you ridicule the, the message of God, your heart becomes corrupt. Lahiyatan qulubuhum. Lahiyatan from the word lahu. Meaning you start becoming preoccupied with frivolous things. You become an aimless person. So when you make, when you mock revelation and you mock God's message, your heart becomes corrupted. And, you know, the, the word, the word lehu is an interesting word. You know, 
if you compare it to the word la'ab, la'ab means to play. You know, if you give a, a child, a toddler, a ball, well, they'll play, right? They're actively playing with the ball and they'll enjoy it. But if you take that same toddler and you put them in front of the TV and you try to get them to watch a soccer match or a basketball game, are they going to enjoy that? They're not. They're going to be like, why should I watch someone else play? I'll go play myself. So lahu, you know, if I want to just, you know, give you an example to kind of illustrate what this means is that lahu is just being entertained with frivolous things. So la'ib, for example, is to play soccer. Lahu is to sit and watch other people play soccer. So here, look at how corrupt these people are. So they go from, so some of them go from attacking the Prophet directly, and then gradually, not only do they attack the Prophet directly, they seek gatherings, and they like listening to other people mock and attack the Prophet. So they, 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 you know, they've become lazy kuffar. So they, it's like they don't want to do it themselves, they just want to go, it's become a spectator sport. So now they're going to others and they're listening. They're enjoying other people mocking the messenger. And they have a private gathering. They have these private gatherings. And it's interesting that Allah says, Wa asarru najwa. They conceal their private conversation. So it's already an, an exclusive meeting. So imagine this, the kuffar, the mushrikeen, and this is in Mecca. They come together, they have like these closed meetings. And even in their meetings, it's just them, they whisper to each other. Now you may think that's strange, that you're, already, you're alone. Why are you whispering to each other when it's already a private, a private meeting? You know, brothers and sisters, it's interesting because the Qur'an is putting its finger on, on an interesting human phenomenon. And that is, it's human nature to whisper when deep down you know what you're saying is wrong and it's immoral. You know, sometimes you see, even in the movies, you know, sometimes you have the bad guys sitting together and when someone wants to mention something that's really, really evil, they'll kind of lean in and they'll whisper it. Because deep down, you know, the fitrah is still there. That nafs al is still there. So even, even though it's a private gathering, there's still like, there's still whispering going on. Alladheena ghalamu. Allah says these are the, the oppressors. They're oppressing themselves first and foremost. And there's a hadith, a very interesting hadith from Imam al-Sadiq. Because the Imam, he comments on this verse. He comments on the application of this verse. He says, The ones who wronged and oppressed the Ahlul Bayt and usurped their rights. Here Imam al-Sadiq is saying that if you look at the Ma'sumin, the Ahlul Bayt, whether it's the Prophet, whether it's the Prophet's martyrdom, whether it's the, shahad, the martyrdom of Fatima al-Zahra, the martyrdom of Imam Ali, the poisoning of Imam al Hassan, these assassinations, these murders began as what? Private meetings. Meaning, the deaths of these holy personalities were not spontaneous, they were planned, and there were meetings that were held, and they were, they were. There were evil people who came together to whisper and to plot. Because my dear brothers and sisters, when evil people come together, their capacity for evil is amplified. Their capacity for evil is amplified. And, and you, if, if, you look at the, if you look at all of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, that their, their deaths their martyrdoms, they were planned. You know, it was not discussed publicly. There were, 
these very, you know, nefarious people, nefarious intentions, corrupt hearts came together and they had private gatherings to plan and to plot how to eliminate these men and women of God. When evil people come together, the capacity for evil is amplified. And conversely, and this is also a lesson for you and I, if evil people come together, their capacity for evil is amplified. And conversely, when good people come together, when mu'mineen, when righteous, when pious people cooperate and they work together, their capacity for good is also amplified. Now, what are they saying in this meeting? They say, Hal hadha illa basharun mithlukum. That, you know, what's, what's the big deal about this Muhammad? Why is everyone so obsessed with him? Why is he so magnetic? They say, oh, why should we follow him? He's just a human being like you. There's nothing special about him. But then... You know when how do they answer if, if he's just like everybody else? Why is why are people flocking to him? Why do people join his faith? After only a small interaction with him, they join him and they're willing to die for him. And look at the explanation that they give, a stupid explanation. They say, that he's he's a magician. He he's a magician. The only way that they could explain the effect that the Prophet was having on the people was that they said that he's a sorcerer. He's a magician. And they say, Are you going to go to him? So not they were, they were not just afraid of people embracing his religion. They were even afraid of people being exposed to him. Are you going to go towards magic while well, you know? So the mushrikeen were afraid of people even meeting the Prophet. And if you see brothers and sisters today, if you look at the world today, there are, there are, there are people in power who don't want you to know the true Islam. They want to keep you away. They try to scare you from even going near Muslims or Islam. They use fear tactics. Are you going to go towards them while you know that you know it's going to be very traumatic? He's going to do something to your soul. In Surah Fusilat, Surah 41, verse 26, Allah says, kafaru. The disbelievers say, La Quran. Don't listen to this Quran. Make a lot of noise. That was their strategy. Keep people away from, from the Prophet. Demonize him. Don't let them hear the message. Don't even let them get near him. So why, why are they attacking the Prophet? Why are they insulting him? This is a sign of fear. Right? When your enemies do this, when they're coming together and tr they're trying to smear your character, that means they're afraid. They know your power. They know your power. They were frustrated, brothers and sisters, because these are the same people who literally killed some of the early Muslims, and that didn't deter the masses. They killed women, children. They socially and economically boycotted the Muslims. But people still, they're coming to the Prophet. Now you may ask, why are they meeting in secret? They're still the majority in Mecca. And that's an interesting contrast. You know, the, the message of Allah is public. Quran is public. It's a public document. But the enemies of the Prophet, they're always meeting in secret. Right? And this is an important difference between Awliyaullah and Awliyaul Shaytan. Awliyaullah, they're very transparent. When, he, when the Prophet was in power, he was very transparent. When Amir al Mu'minin was the Khalifa, he was transparent. Muawiyah wasn't transparent. Corrupt people are not transparent. 
Islam is public. Islam is transparent. The enemies of Islam, those who plot against the Prophet and the message, they're always having these backdoor, behind closed door meetings. They're plotting. They're not transparent. They're deceptive. So why are they meeting in secret? Because whenever they publicly challenge the Prophet, they're humiliated. A verse of the Quran is revealed about them. Because the nature of haq is that haq, when it is presented, when it becomes clear, it obliterates batil. Nur, if you introduce light, it eradicates darkness. So that's why they don't want a public confrontation. They have to, they have to create fitna behind the scenes. And another reason why they have these private gatherings is because the mushrikeen want to be united in their strategy to counter the Prophet. Right? So, you know, if, if kuffar, if mushrikeen understand the importance of unity, how united do the believers have to be? And then, verse number, verse number four, and inshallah we'll conclude here. So this, so imagine this, brothers and sisters. The enemies of the Prophet, the polytheists, the mushrikeen, they have these private meetings where they're mocking the Prophet. And they're saying things like, he's just a human being. He's a, he's a sorcerer, he's a magician, stay away from him. This happened in private. And then, verse number four. قَالَ رَبِّي يَعْلَمُ الْقَوْلَ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ قَالَ He said, who said? The Prophet. The Prophet says, My Lord knows that which is spoken in heaven and on earth. And He is the all-hearing and the all-knowing. Can you imagine the reaction of the mushrikeen? That the Prophet says, by the way, I know about your meeting. What meeting? The meeting where you guys came together and you said that I'm just a human being like you, that I'm a magician, that this is sorcery. Can you imagine how shocked they must have been? That, that he knew exactly what they spoke about in secret. And this, brothers and sisters, is a beautiful verse because the prophet was mocked and he was insulted. And you and I, you know, chances are in life, people are going to insult us. People are going to mock us. People are going to say hurtful things. How do we cope with insults, with mockery? How do, how do we cope when we are victims of slander and backbiting? The best way to cope is to know that Allah knows what was spoken. What is important is to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-hearing and He's the all-knowing. All that, just having the, that knowledge, that ma'rifah, that nothing happens without the knowledge of God, that should give you solace. That everything is un happening under His watchful eye and He hears the public conversations and He hears the private conversations. We ask Allah Azza wa to give us the tawfiq to be among those who understand the Qur'an and benefit from the teachings of the Qur'an. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us away from the ways and the behavior of the enemies of the message and to be among the sincere followers of the Prophet and his Immaculate Family. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Sheikh. Uh, apology for earlier the the, the distributing class earlier. No, no problem, no problem. As long as was ever was everybody able to hear? Yeah, so the problem was actually on my side. Everyone else was able to hear just fine. Okay, okay, no worries, no worries. Um. So uh, one question about the the lecture. Would could you please compare uh, the covert behavior of the Munafikun and why they were doing it versus how Islam was covert in its first few years and the different reasons why each of them had to be covert? Now, <clears throat> Islam was 
Islam was was covert in its infancy not because the message itself was problematic it's because of it was an issue of uh, of safety right so the motives behind why things were, are secretive are different so the mushrikeen are coming together in secret because they have a plot to to destroy to cause harm Whereas the Prophet beginning his message in secrecy is a, is a strategy of gradually introducing truths that are going to shake the foundations of, of society. So he wasn't secretive because, of, because there was anything to be ashamed of. Whereas the, uh, the Mushrikeen, they, uh, they just didn't want that information to ever get out. Whereas the Prophet was doing this as a part of his strategy to uh, to spread uh, to spread the message and build and to build a strong base. Thank you. And, and also, um, uh, in the same verse earlier, oh, talk about how when uh, evil people come together, their capacity for evil increases, and with good people, their capacity for good it increases. Yes. Yeah. Uh, capacity referring just to their uh, physical ability to act or also to their mental willingness to do good and evil both both i mean i i think that when you when you combined resources it has a, it has a a material effect meaning that you have more bodies you have more power you have more resources, resources. and in addition to that it's a it's a powerful motivator Right, you know, when you see that there are others, so there, there's a, it's, it's a morale booster to see that you know you have, you have support. So there are material benefits and psychological benefits to having people uh, come together. Thank you. And, and in uh, verse two, could you uh, elaborate a bit on the meaning of the word play? Uh, the uh, at the end. So Wahum Yal Abun. So verse uh I'm sorry, verse number verse number two, yes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the beginning of the verse, Allah basically says that these are people, no matter what, they refuse, they reject the message, you know. Whether, even if it's a small, gentle reminder, whether it's, and it's a reminder from their Lord, and it's something that's new, إِلَّا اسْتَمَعُوهُ وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ So they're, they're listening. So if you look at these individuals, they seem to be listening attentively. وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ This wow is wow uh, الْحَالِيَ Basically, it's, it's a wow that describes their state they're listening attent they look like they're listening attentively but the intention is yalabun that they're playing around they're messing around so when the prophet is speaking you know they lean in for example they have their eyes wide open it appears as though they're being attentive but but they're just they're they're playing games they're just gathering more material to mock and, and you know when i was reading this verse it reminded me of a, a contemporary example. You know, many of you are familiar with Richard Dawkins, yes? You know, he debates theists, you know, that, he, he's made a career out of, you know, uh, promoting uh, atheism. And, uh, and oftentimes he mocks, you know, he, he, he digresses from the actual debate and he just starts making uh, insulting remarks and he starts making fun of religion. And I remember one one day, I think he posted this on social media, where and and he and he presents himself as a scientist, as someone who's thoughtful, someone who's intellectual. But you see, he can't even hide this tendency to mock and to make fun of God and religion. And he actually designed a T-shirt, and on the T-shirt it said, it has the word religion in bold, and underneath it it says. Together we can find the cure, right? As if it's like an illness. Together we can find the cure. So, so th these are the types of people that that Allah is talking about. That they pretend to listen and to be thoughtful and to be reflective, but it's they turn it into into a game. They just they just make fun. They play around. 
they mess around so yalabun here means that they're just they're they pretend to be attentive they pretend to listen but they're doing it in a uh, uh, as a, you know to make a mockery they're doing it just to kind of make fun of the uh, the prophet so, uh, in that case um, so what do the uh, the zikrs in this case uh, refer to like especially if they're are these zikrs something that continue, uh, continues on to today are we still continually getting these new reminders so <clears throat> the word so the, it's it's not it doesn't specify what uh, what the, the the reminder is per se, but some of the mufassirin they say it's it's a reference to wahi scripture, you know whether it's the Torah, the Injil, the Zabur, any reminder that comes from God, you know min dhikrin min rabbihim, you know if you go just by the apparent that we're talking about revelation, we're talking about revelation, and. Uh, if you want to extend it beyond that, you know, the universe is filled with ayat. You know, everywhere you look, there is a, a reminder. But first and foremost, it seems that the verse is speaking about revelation. Min dhikrin min rabbin. And, and, it would, and it would apply today because, you know, the, the book of Allah is still among us. And, you know, there are those who approach it with, with, uh, with an unbiased attitude. They uh, approach it with uh, with an attitude of objectivity that there's at least an interest. Let me consider what this book is saying. And there are those who just you know who who who, who would purchase a copy of the Quran or borrow a Quran just to go through it and and just make fun of what's in it. So the attitude is still there today. So some approach the Word of God because you know they want to learn, they want to benefit, they want to at least see what the Quran says. Just for kind of intellectual uh, stimulation, and there are those who know the Quran. They have their highlighter, and they just highlight what they want to make fun of. So you know, it's still relevant today. I thank you so much, Sheikh. Ahsan to barakallahu fikum. And if if you uh, if you guys can, uh, I know I many of you know that uh, that uh, Sheikh Vinay's. Uh, wife passed away today and you know many people you know because she was buried today you know people are interested in doing salatul wahsha but just as a reminder and i and i, I mentioned this to any any time that there's a death in the community people automatically say okay we're going to do salatul wahsha the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi in a hadith he says irhamu mawtakum bisadaqa that have mercy on your deceased by giving charity if you are not able to give charity, then perform Salatul Wahsha. Typically what happens, we ignore the Sadaqah and we offer Salatul Wahsha. It's fine, you can perform Salatul Wahsha. You know, do both if you want, but don't underestimate the value of Sadaqah. So if you really want to benefit our beloved sister who passed away, the best thing to do is what the Prophet says, that give charity, whether it's $10, $20, $100, whatever amount, give Sadaqah. Don't just say, I'm going to ignore the sadaqah and just do salatul wahsha. Salatul wahsha was there for people who don't have the ability to give charity. You know, people who just didn't have the means. And alhamdulillah, most of us, we have the means to give charity. So tonight, in her name, give charity. And if you want to also do salatul wahsha, you can, uh, you can do that. Jazakumullah khair al jaza. Inshallah, we'll continue our discussion. Uh, uh, Inshallah, keep us in your dua, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.